Hey, everybody. We're so excited to have Nico Salgado on the Tech Guys Who Invest today. Nico, thanks so much for coming on the show. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. I am excited. Awesome. awesome. Well, we know that your background is teaching and you've taught in uh, New York City. So we'd love to kind of hear about that experience being a teacher for the number of years that you did it. I'm still teaching. So yeah, so I started back in 2004 and I started in Queens. I worked in two different schools in Queens. Uh, I taught for five years in Queens and it was cool, man. It was kind of a whirlwind. You know, the first year, I don't even remember. Um, <laughs> we can just erase that from my memory forever. And it's kind of, uh, you know, from then on, I just, I, I learned a lot about dealing with people. Um, I guess managing and controlling uh, a classroom and a curriculum and driving people and kids in, in particular to getting to a certain point to where that at the end of the year, I felt that they could be successful in the language that I'm teaching. So I'm a Spanish teacher. And my goal was always, aside from the curriculum that we had to teach, my goal was always to be able to say that if I drop you guys off in the middle of Spain or Spanish speaking country, we'll just be able to survive. And I can check that box at the end of every year. And that's really what made it worthwhile for me. That's a nice. great measurement. <laughs> Yeah, because yeah. you know what I mean, like there's there's so much in with the curriculum and so many and, and the tests and all that. But what, what it really comes down to is can these kids survive if they were alone in a Spanish speaking country? Can they get food? Can they find shelter? Can they can maybe connect with somebody that can provide them a, a, a means of contacting their family? You know, that, those are the really most important things. And then I also really like to build rapport with kids and anybody that I work with to see whether or not I can spark an interest in them. Because if I, I found that if I can at least engage the kids to have them interested in something. I can keep their attention a lot longer. I love it. So Nico, somewhere along the way, uh, you, you discovered a lack of financial literacy and, and started to help kids with that. Is that correct? Actually, no. So I, I discovered the financial illiteracy. Yes. Have I begun to help students with it? No. And I'm still, I'm actually working on something as we speak. My goal is to, at this point, because I'm still teaching Spanish, but I realized that only fairly recently that there is such a lack of financial intelligence in our school system. There, it's not yeah. geared. We're not geared and set up to, to teach kids about the real world and what it is to, you know, to, to create wealth for, each, for ourselves. What, what we teach kids is how to work at a job. We teach kids how to do menial tasks. We teach kids you know, how to get by in, in a world where they got somebody standing over them. But we don't teach kids how to be independent learners. We don't teach them how to seek and find, you know, things that they like to do, that they love to do, that are fulfilling for them. And in the end, you know, it's, it's, it's where I'm finding many kids coming out of college and not knowing what to do, you know. So now, back to your point, what I'm doing is I'm attempting to set up a program uh, where I get kids in the morning or in the afternoon where they're going to come in and we're just going to start by playing games similar to what you guys do like the uh the what is it the cash flow game by uh, exactly Rich Dad. yeah exactly i want to get them hooked on something like that just because like i said before if i can spark an interest that is where i believe the kids are going to be able to relate to something and then want to continue because you can't you know force anybody to do anything in this world but if I can spark an interest in them in some in, in some sort of business finance and let them know that there's a better way to do things or a different way, then I think that I can get a real good following. And that's uh, not happening this year due to COVID, but hopefully next year. <laughs> nice. Great. So when we talk about that financial intelligence, I didn't really become I'm not I wouldn't consider myself financially literate in the regards of, or I know everything that I should know about financial literacy. I know enough to kind of help me survive and help me thrive. And it wasn't until, you know, my thirties that I felt, I mean, I'm only 31. So until I hit 30, <laughs> that I really felt that way. Uh, how, and, and that was from a series of books, right? Books, podcasts, networking, talking to people. How would you recommend young people or just even someone who wants to start learning about financial literacy? How would you recommend they do that? You know, I'm the same. I, I feel the same. I, there has to be a desire or a drive inside of you. Sometimes it comes from a negative force of, you know, like, oh, no, I'm not making ends meet or, oh, no, this job is wearing me down or it's terrible. Or sometimes it comes and what hopefully we can create is some sort of inner desire or inner drive in students or in young people or in people earlier than your 30s or 31, you know, so that they can discover that there is other things in life besides just getting a nine to five. Because when we get nine to five jobs, 
we're there just for a paycheck. We're not there to, to, to produce or generate anything necessarily beneficial for us or, or those around us. We're just trying to get paid. And it's exactly the same as school where somebody's telling you exactly what to do. You're not thinking on your own. And to create those independent you know, thinkers, it's, it's going to take a different mindset. And to your point, I learn also, Kevin, through books, through podcasts, through meeting with people, communicating with people, but it only came when I was ready to do that. Now, if we can share, my, my hypothesis is, if we can show kids that there are different ways to do things by providing them with either some sort of an apprenticeship, or if they want to watch how, it, how it's done on social media, however they consume their, you know, their, uh, their information, however they best consume their information, if we can show them that there are different ways besides just getting a nine to five, then I think that's really the way to go. Love it. Nice. Yeah, me too. That's great. So, uh, Nico, somewhere along your path, you, you discovered investing and multifamily. Can you tell us a little bit about how that played out for you? Yeah. So I'm still doing it. So, you know, I, I was in the, I'm still in the grind. I'm still working as a teacher and I've been doing it for, this is my 17th year teaching now. And in, I started in 2004. Now in 2012, um, I bought a piece of land and I've always been interested in real estate because I always knew, you know, you, you get this general concept of you see somebody owning, let's say an apartment, right? Or let's say they own a, a single family house or a, two, a duplex or something. And you see that they are not living there, but they're getting income from it. So something is, you know, you're getting paid for that. And I always thought that that's something that I could do. You know, it's not like I'm waking up and I'm working for, for somebody. It's like I own something that is paying me. And that was, you know, always in the back of my mind prior to reading, you know, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And when I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, it really kind of just clarified everything for me. But prior to that, I always was, you know, you can see that you can see it happening, people owning either maybe their house hacking or whatever it is, and they're getting income from it. And that really intrigued me. So I, I attempted to do that. Before 2012, I was looking into many different properties here on Long Island, where I live in New York, Long Beach, in particular, and I wasn't finding anything as expensive. Uh, but I did find a little piece of land in Nicaragua. Now, so to backtrack a little bit, I'm a surfer. I've been surfing my entire life. You know, you might not think that there are waves in New York, but we actually have some good waves here. <laughs> and I've been surfing my entire life. So, and I traveled my entire life to surf. And I found a beautiful secluded spot in Nicaragua. I found a piece of land for very cheap. And I was able to build a house on that for very cheap. And the ultimate goal was to rent it out during the year and then have my family come down on the, you know, whenever we wanted to, to visit and, and utilize it. But it, it, it ended up not working. I mean, I bought the property, I built the house, but the house just got finished only a few months ago, right before COVID hit. So I had my first person ready to uh, Airbnb it and they fled the country just as COVID hit. So it, it, that is still a dream that's still happening, but that was my first taste of real estate. And what I learned was that, you know, I put down a, between the land and the building itself, it cost me $60,000. And now I actually have it up for sale just to see what it would be. And it's up for 120,000. And I got a couple of offers, fairly low, but you know, you, you look at that, it's like double what I paid for it. Right. Wow. Nice. Return. That's awesome. Yeah. I that's a very so. nice return. <laughs> yeah. If I sell it, but I'm probably not going to sell it. So, but then, you know, I, I continued looking for throughout this time, I continued looking for, you know, uh, I was going to buy duplexes here in Long Island and I couldn't shake the mindset that I, I, I thought that I had to be in my backyard to buy property. Now, after searching bigger pockets, I spent months on bigger pockets, talking to people. And then after finally linking up with people in the Jake and Gino community, I learned that multifamily was a thing. And I learned that it was something that was possible for anybody and somebody like me. So I went full steam ahead in November, 2019 into the Jake and Gino community to learn about multifamily. And here I am a year later, closed on one deal, really excited. It took me just about exactly a year to do it and making it happen, my man. Congrats. <laughs> Cheers. Congratulations, Nico. So when it comes to that, that, that first deal, uh, if you don't mind, we'd love to kind of pick your brain about that experience for that first one. Cause I feel that that first deal is always the hardest one. And then once mm -hmm. you realize, Oh, it's possible. 
right? You, you think you, you have this idea that when you're learning about it, oh, I can do this too. And then when you finally do it, you're like, yes, I am a, a multifamily investor. And then it snowballs. So I'd love to hear kind of from your experience, what was the mindset and how did that shift once you closed? Yeah, it becomes real, right? It's, 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 an, it's amazing. Like, you know, you have all these thoughts of how it's going to go or how you want it to go. And it actually didn't go at all the way I wanted it to go, but it went. And I'm happy now in the end that it went this way. So I, I've been looking, you know, as Adam knows, and I think Kevin, you probably know too, but I've been looking down in Tampa since November of 2019. I, you know, I, I began creating a network of people down there, talking to people, um, you know, brokers, property managers, people that wanted to invest with me, boots on the ground. I have a team basically assembled down there and I've submitted plenty of offers. I've underwritten over a hundred deals, submitted plenty of offers, at least 30 plus offers. And we haven't landed a deal down there yet. And as you guys know, it is, it's quite competitive, but I met up with a few guys that were in the Jake and Gino community. Also, I met up with them in May or June and they were looking to invest in Tampa. Now here's the thing about focusing on one market. You know, I spent all these months and months creating a network down there. And then when the people in the Jake and Gino community were ready to go look in Tampa as well, they just reached out to me and automatically now we are looking, we were looking at deals together. So that gave me some, and they, they had experience, you know, so that gave me some confidence to put in some more offers and to, you know, to really try to create a footing and, and uh, you know, home base down in Tampa. So from then we submitted on a bunch of deals together and we didn't land anything, but they found another property because they, they were looking in other markets as well in Columbus, Ohio. And they asked me to join their team. This was in late July. And I told them I couldn't for a few reasons. If you guys want to hear, I mean. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All sure. right. So one of the reasons, the main reason rather, is that I, I told them I couldn't join them because I'm currently going through a divorce and all of my funds are frozen. So I couldn't contribute anything financially. And I didn't feel comfortable joining a team without contributing something financially. Although they did tell me, they were like, you know, don't worry about it. You know, we've had, we've worked with somebody going through a divorce before and we can write up some kind of document or some kind of agreement showing that within a year or a year from now or two years or whatever, you can pay X amount. I just didn't feel comfortable doing it. And then number two, I said, you know what? I've been focusing exclusively on Tampa. I need to land something in Tampa. So for those two reasons, I didn't join their team right away. Now, as you guys know, or maybe, you know, I don't know, Adam, because you might have, it might not have been this challenging for you, but raising capital during a, you know, the times that we're in wasn't easy for them. So they struggled a little bit on the capital raise. This was a syndication, by the way, it was 194 units in Columbus, Ohio. Um, and they struggled with the raise. They came back to me two months later, just saying, please join our team, help us out with the raise. You can do marketing for us. You can do investor relations. And this is what I've been working on anyway. Uh, and I said, yes. So in late, late October, I joined their team and we ended up doing a, I did another webinar for them. We ended up raising more capital and we ended up closing just about a couple of weeks ago. Congrats. Congrats. Yeah. yeah. That's great. <laughs> you, know you know what? what? And what? I didn't, I didn't even put money down to be honest with you. I ended up borrowing some money from my brother, just the bare minimum, just to get into the deal. And they were happy to have me and I am ecstatic to be on their team. Well, that's even better. OPM. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not putting your own money in is, is the ultimate. What, what made you arrive at multifamily for your investor identity? There are so many options to choose from everything from, well, you mentioned land earlier to you know, notes and uh, single family rental houses. There's a million things you could have chosen. How is it that you kind of landed on, on this? A few reasons. I mean, the first reason was that I fell upon the Jake and Gino community and I just really clicked with their, you know, with their image their and their message. And I wanted to join their team. So okay. besides even thinking about multifamily in general, and that's what they specialize in, I was like, I like this team. I want to be a part of this team. Then once I started doing multifamily, I realized, you know, the, the stigma, uh, not necessarily stigma, but the, I guess the label attached to it, you get, it's kind of a, it, let's say you own an apartment building. That is cool. You know, that's really cool. And I thought yeah. that that was, that was something I definitely wanted to do too. And as I started learning, you know, more about the economies of scale, the feasibility of it, the stability of multifamily, all these factors really kind of just solidified my, my choice in asset class. Now, 
I do, you know, occasionally look at like mobile home parks. I will listen to people talking about developments. I don't feel confident in my ability to, you know, invest in any of that yet, but in the future, it's a possibility. Right now I'm laser focused on multifamily for a ton of reasons, basically the stability, uh, the economies of scale, like I was talking about earlier. And I enjoy it. You know, I enjoy the fact that I can, we can take like a C asset with working class families, create a nicer C class asset, C plus B asset, provide people with a nice place to live and just create an overall environment for success in a community. Yeah. It's a way of giving back to the community, as you mentioned, and making a way, uh, making a return for you and your investors. I don't see anything wrong with that. You are literally adding value to that community and, and you kind of reap those rewards as you come and fix uh, certain problems, whether that's maintenance, a new roof or the units that need to be repaired because that landlord hadn't for a while. Now, I know that you're, you're doubling down in Tampa and you've got this deal, but what about Tampa? So for our listeners who are trying to figure out, I don't know which market to look at, what are some of the, the high level stuff that you said, oh, Tampa has all of these, I wanna double down and be there. Yeah, well, there's, so there's a lot of things to look at, right? My first reason was because my wife had family down there, and we're the one, the wife I'm divorcing right now. So she has family down there, and we visited a few times. You know, it is a place that we like to go together. We like to go personally. I like to go. I, I still have a lot of friends down there. I actually have friends apart from my wife's side of the family that live down there and also work uh, as architects, two architects down there. I have somebody who runs an apartment building himself down there. So I have a lot of connections down there anyway. So number one, it was feasible to travel to. Uh, number, you know, somewhere that I would, wouldn't mind going. And I think that's important for people to, you know, to decide also when they're choosing a market, not only the metrics that we look at, you know, on the other side. And on top of that, obviously, you, you always want to look at population growth. Are people moving in? Because if people are moving out, that's a bad sign. You know, they're, they're obviously not going to be you know, staying in your apartment, they're not going to be looking to rent apartment buildings if they're moving out. So you want to look for population growth, you want to look for job growth, you want to look for job diversity, you know, those things, those are some key metrics that I always look at when analyzing any market, and especially when getting into the Tampa market. Now, also the weather down there, I mean, it's a place that I would like to take my family on vacation, you know. Yeah, we're wearing t-shirts right now. Oh, come on. Uh, I got the heat on. Bit fat. <laughs> Let me zip up here. Mid, mid December. I'll get the month. Yeah, well, you turn the heat on too when it gets below 60. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm trying this thing is set for 60. I'm trying to get there. <laughs> <laughs> so so Nico, uh, one of the things that I think is most cool about your story is the fact that you're a teacher building wealth. And there's a there is a self-limiting belief by some people that if you're not already wealthy or have some super high paying job, like a, a lawyer or a specialized doctor, you, you can't do this. You can't invest in that. But, you know, I feel like you're proof that any of us can, if we put our mind to it, uh, how can people who may think they are, uh, not in a position to be able to do this. How, you know, what, what advice might you have for them for getting started in multifamily? Yeah, they need to stop that thought. And it's not easy. You know, we're, we're, we're we live in a society where we're beaten down a lot as, as difficult as, as it is to say, you know, saying people telling us we can't do X, Y, and Z for whatever reasons. And there's a lot of negative uh, stigma and negative emotions attached with the word being rich, even they're attached with wanting to earn money that people call you greedy, you know, but in my mind, if you are first, let, let yourself know and, and come out with the truth that you are a good person. And if you are a good person and you are a wealthy, good person, you're 10 times better than a negative or a bad person with money. So you want to be the person who's wealthy if you are a good person. So I like to start there. I like to tell people that it's okay to want money. It's okay to want wealth for you, your family, your friends, your loved ones and society and even, you know, the, the, the world at large. It's okay to, to wish that for everybody. Then I like to talk to people about the fact that, you know, I, I'm paying 60%, you know, for my mortgage right now of my, of my, my income, you know, I'm barely, I'm not making anything. I live paycheck to paycheck. How is this possible that I just bought a 194 unit building, right? It's very possible. And the reason why it's possible is I 
believe it's possible, number one. And then number two, I, I connect with the right people. And that comes a lot from a lot of work within. It comes from a lot of, of a place where I need to discover what value I bring to a team. And I really need to double down on that and really need to focus on all my energies on creating, filling a gap for a team. Because if you can do that, it's more valuable than the money you bring, right? It, so so I, when I talk to people who are just getting started in multifamily, I like to let them know that you have a spot on a team, okay? There are definitely team uh, members that are teams that are looking for certain team members. You just have to find the right team. So find your skill and double down and make sure, and, and don't let the, you know, we, we get this monkey mind where we like, we try to jump from here to there and, and oh, and now I'm going to be a capital raiser. No, now I'm going to be a marketing specialist. No, now I'm going to be the financial analyst. Pick what you really enjoy doing and what you're good at and stick to it hard. And then you'll find yourself in the right spot on the right team. I love it. So similar to an investor identity where you figure out what niche you want to focus on, you have to kind of look inward and figure out what it is you want to do. What do you want to be good at? Because that can instantly bring value being that specialist. So, and, and, and it's almost like focusing on your strengths and making the strengths stronger as opposed mm -hmm. to just focusing on a weakness and trying to bring it up. You, you kind of amplify your efforts by um, amplifying what you're, what you're good at. Yeah. Isn't this like what we're taught in school? We're supposed to try to do what we really love to do. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you know, I, it's funny. I went to school originally for marketing management and I minored in economics and I didn't do anything with that. I went back to school after to right away to become a Spanish teacher and I studied Spanish literature. Um, but what I really wanted to do originally was marketing. I just didn't understand really what it was. Now I enjoy it. I enjoy the fact that I can, that we have such access to social media and other different other platforms where I can present myself to the world, where I can you know, create a brand, create a label for myself, create an image around something. It's, I think that's, that's really interesting to me. Now, it might not be to everybody. And that's why that's not your spot on a team. And that's okay, right? Like I said, find your spot, double down, and, and you'll find the right team. Love it. I love it. And that's a very, that's very good advice for anybody that's listening, that's thinking of being on the active side, or if you're kind of on the fence, not sure where you want to fit, that's one way to do it is just kind of do what you enjoy about the, the investing aspect. And it will kind of follow. Uh, speaking of, of marketing, I know that you host a podcast, and I wanted to pick your brain about what would you say are some of the, the best lessons that you've learned being a podcast host? Yeah, so I'm, what am I? I'm like 15, 18 episodes, I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, so I, it's funny. I spoke to John Kasman and you guys know John Kasman also. And he got me going on this podcast. He, you know, when I, my first conversation with him was like, you can do this, man. Have you ever thought about being a podcast host? And I was shaking. I was like, no, it's something I can't do. And he was like, you got this, man. Just from our conversation that we had, he's like, I think you can handle this. And I was like, all right. So I did it. Now he told me something and that I found to be true. He said, it's not necessarily about the listeners or the audience, but it's it, if, if you can find value in the conversations with the caliber of person that you have, I think that is huge. So for me personally, talking to people like you, Kevin, Adam, talking to people like I've had on previous, you know, podcast episodes, I'm creating relationships with the right people. You know, let's say I get 30 listeners on that on the last podcast, who cares, I'm creating good relationships with the right people leaders in the industry. And that's important. Yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, Kevin and I talk about this periodically, how much value this podcast has brought into both of our lives. I mean, it, it is one of the biggest things that's happened to me in the last few years. I, I love it. Yeah. It's, um, you know, what? sorry. Yeah, no, go, go ahead. It, it if people are listening to, you know, I say that, you know, I'm only getting a few listeners, but it's funny because, you know, I'll post about, you know, my latest episodes or whatever, and then I'll get feedback here. And then I'd love to hear the feedback. Honestly, I'm, it's like my first year of teaching. I'm not great at it yet. And that's okay. I don't expect to be great at it. And it's all kind of a blur, the first ones, but I know that in time, if in the industry so people are like oh nico he if he has a podcast this is kind of like this facade we put in front of us to kind of ex exemplify you know what a leader is in the industry and, and it's like 
so when people approach me or reach out to me, they kind of have like a little hesitancy, like, whoa, Nico's big time. You've got a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not necessarily true, but it kind of creates that, doesn't it? It yeah. creates credibility. Kevin and I talked yes. about that a lot. Yes. It creates credibility. and Absolutely uh, does. You know what else is really cool here it is some of the parallels between doing something like launching a podcast and investing in real estate and even anything that you want to be performing at the highest level or successful at, you know, it, it takes time. It takes effort. You have to just get started. And we talk about that a lot. You must take action, get started. Yes. It's going to be messy at first. Of course, our first few episodes were rough, but we got started and it grows over time. You get more refined, uh, you get more listeners and it just continues to expand just like your first real estate deal, right? You get that thing done, take action to get it done and then it will expand. It's pretty neat. Yeah. You know, I'm, I, I, I came to the conclusion. I said, you know what? I am going to accept the fact that I'm going to stink at this for at least a few months. And then and that just settled everything. I said, all right, let's do it. Stink or not stink. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. That's <laughs> awesome. First few episodes we have, I think the first, I don't know, 10, 15, you can tell Adam and I are still gathering our chemistry, but it's part of it, right? Now I, I know when when to jump in when Adam is talking, we rarely interrupt each other, we feed off each other's energy. The mm -hmm. same holds true when you're finding partnerships, building those relationships. Uh, it, you, you get to know each other, get to figure out ways that you can balance each other out, enhance each other's strengths, and the other person can kind of uh, pick you up where, where you're weak. So working with people and, and having a podcast, I, I highly recommend it. And also selfishly, you can start a podcast to just talk to awesome people that you wouldn't necessarily have the chance without having a podcast. So I think that's kind of a cool thing that, that I'm sure Adam may feel the same way when it comes to the guests that we have. So it's so cool talking to some of these people that we would never get a chance to talk to otherwise. It's just really interesting. So we're talking a lot about podcasts and, um, and it, I, I'm just curious, Nico, if as someone is kind of curious about getting started investing, maybe they listen to this episode and they get inspired. Is there a book or a podcast or, or some kind of content that you would point them to? Yeah. I mean, it depends on what they're looking to do. You know, my first, I mean, I, I, I gotta say, you know, start with rich dad, poor dad. If they haven't done that, if they haven't had a, a simple mind shift yet, if they're ready for real estate investing, you know, jump on books like Joe Fairless's book, you know, jump on books like, uh, like Gino Barbro's book, jump on books like, you know, anything that maybe Brandon Turner's put out, simple books to, to start get you thinking real estate, right? And then once you can narrow down, you know, things that you like or you think would fit best with your investment style or your lifestyle, then start narrowing down maybe multifamily books or podcasts, maybe, you know, self-storage books or podcasts and try to get a little bit more specific. And I always recommend, you know, once you get that far, make sure you definitely stick with one thing at least give one, one asset a year. You know what I mean? Like I'm focusing on multifamily now for this first year and I will continue to do so, but at some point I might switch, but I, you know, I had the opportunity to look at development before and mobile home parks and I stayed away from it. I stayed focused, you know, on multifamily. So I recommend that for everybody too. As far as a specific book, you know, for me, it was, it was, I went from rich dad, poor dad into like Joe Fairless's book. And then I learned about syndication right away. And I got excited knowing that you can buy gigantic buildings and syndicate it. Nice. Love it. So uh, when it comes to um, a podcast, what would you say is your go-to uh, when you want to learn something new about real estate, right? Like if you're probably at that next level, of investing and you say, you know what, I've heard the rich dad, poor dad, I want to learn more. And you said, Joe Fairless, uh, would that be a next progression for podcast resource or something along those lines? Yeah, definitely. So I, I'm always, I listen to your guys podcast. Uh, I started listening to you guys months and months ago. <laughs> I I, it's funny. I like the way you guys jive. And I think just to backtrack for a second, I think it's really important for those people out there who are terrified to be, or don't think that they can do podcasting, do it with a partner like you guys are doing because I, I feel that there's a ton of value in it for the listeners and for you guys. 
So don't, you know, if, if you're terrified out there, do it with a friend or a buddy. And I actually did that with a meetup. I joined uh, forces with one of my partners on a meetup. And, you know, besides the fact that we help each other jive through a meetup, we also get to, um, you know, like if I need a night off or there's something wrong or an emergency, he can cover for me. So that's important too. Um, but back to your point of podcasts. So like I then recommend to, I, I'm always listening to podcasts and reading books at the same time. Now I started also with Joe Fairless's podcast, moved on. I, I listened to your podcast, John Kasman's podcast. I always still listen to John Kasman's podcast, Jake and Gino, the Wheelbarrow Profits podcast. Uh, those are typically the ones that I stick with. Um, occasionally I'll, I'll listen to like Ellie Perlman. Um, but so, so again, my specifically for me, I'm looking at multifamily and I'm looking to do syndications. So that's where I, fo I focus on, you know, the podcasts that are going to educate me in that manner. Excellent. Well, for those of you who are listening and not watching on YouTube, uh, we can see in the background, some really cool wood, like, looks like some uh, art to me. Nico, <laughs> I know as you you do some woodworking. Can you, can you tell us how you got started in that? Yeah, so I love working with my hands. And this goes back to like growing up and you know, everybody he, were kind of raised, I don't know if you guys were, but I was always raised, my father was straight out of Spain. You know, he moved, when he was 17, he left Spain, he went to Cuba. Uh, during the high times in the 50s. And then when Castro came in, he came to New York and met my mom and blah, blah, blah. So <laughs> he, he was always like, you know, the harder you work, the more money you're going to make. So I was always constantly making things when I was younger and trying to sell things. I tried to make a go-kart when I was eight. I tried to make a, <laughs> I tried to make a, a parasail out of sticks and, and garbage bags. I tried to make a pool. Like I tried to just make, I used to love making things, thinking that the harder that I would work, you know, the more money I would make or the more successful I can be. But I also enjoyed, you know, tinkering around. So anyway, after teaching for a long time, I was always intrigued by construction. My friends were doing it. I would, you know, I, I built a lot of my house, actually. Uh, I, I worked with my friends that did construction from time to time. And then 2018, we got hit with a $4,000 a year tax increase. We were paying $8,000 a year, and then it went up to twelve five. Uh, for taxes, which is expensive. It's just ridiculous. We live in a very expensive area and I couldn't afford it. I wasn't ready for it. We were facing what was called imminent foreclosure. I was living paycheck to paycheck as it was. So I needed to pick up something else. I already, so I work in the mornings before school. I, I created a certain program to, to teach kids med meditation, fitness, and et Love cetera. That. And yeah. And I was also trying to transition this year into doing the financial literacy, which is not happening. After school, I coach. I coached a few sports a year. And then in the summer, I teach surfing as well. So I'm always working and I, I, I mentor teachers and I teach teacher courses at school too. So I'm always constantly working. So I decided, you know, I needed to push myself and pick up more work and let me do something that I enjoy doing. So I picked up woodwork and I already had some tools in my garage, but I ended up creating <laughs> and making my garage into a literal wood shop. It's a, it's a, full full on wood shop and I ended up spending so many nights there building things and I, I and I strategized saying look I'm just going to focus on one little thing one thing that I can ship to everybody that I can replicate and make a lot of and it ended up being cutting boards and you know I spent a lot of time learning you know there's a lot behind making a, a good stable cutting board that goes in the kitchen that's sanitary and 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 there's different different designs and different cut different ways to cut the wood to make it a better cutting experience for your knives. Anyway, I learned all that stuff, made a bunch of cutting boards and sold a bunch of cutting boards just to try to make ends meet and to try to pay the you know our now inflated taxes. So it ended <laughs> up <laughs> it ended up working. We saved our house, and now I I just do it really for fun. Awesome. What a story. Yeah, I didn't see that coming. Yes. Good. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> no, it's awesome. So lessons there, the taxes, property taxes in New York, expensive, but woodworking is also a, a, a an art form. Medita you could probably argue that you can build mindfulness through woodworking is what I would imagine. Um, but if anybody who is listening to this and not watching the YouTube video, check out Nico's work. Go to follow his podcast, or excuse me, his Instagram, and you can see kind of the process. I love watching. It's almost like 
it's satisfying, right? You smooth out the wood next thing you know, I think it's some type of epoxy that you put on it. And now it goes from like dull to shiny. I'm just like, man, that, that looks good. So just throwing <laughs> that out there. It looks good. Thanks, Kevin. Cool. So uh, we wouldn't be the tech guys who invest if we didn't ask about technology. However, we're going to continue with this woodworking that you do. We wanted to ask you, what would you say is your favorite piece of technology when it comes to woodworking? I, I don't know anything about woodworking, so I'm just curious. All right. So if we're talking about technology now, I, I mean, I use a CNC machine to engrave things and wow. this CNC machine, they can be expensive, right? But I ended up buying a fairly cheap one that I had to build myself. <laughs> so again, like all, <laughs> all these, the more work I put in, you know, I, I put in so many hours and so many nights spending up, you know, I ended up building a CNC machine. Uh, they give you the tools to do it or whatever. So the CNC machine is excellent because you can carve designs, you can engrave names and things like that. And, and just any kind of design you want on a piece of wood, people like that. Now, if, if we're talking technology, that's what I would say. However, my favorite tool in the shop, I got to say, is still just the, the plain old table saw, man. I love slicing through wood. Excellent. <laughs> I love that stuff. I love tools. And so I couldn't wait to hear what you were going to say there. That's awesome. Well, Nico, this has been fantastic. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Uh, it's been great having you on. Uh, can you tell our listeners where they can find you and, uh, you know, maybe where they can get your podcast and, and catch up with you? Yeah, I think the best way to find me is on my website, smallaxcommunities.com. So small A-X-E, smallaxcommunities.com. And that comes from Bob Marley's song, The Small Axe. And I originally came up with that for my wood shop because the theory was all I needed was my little hands, my small axe to build a giant empire. And that's really where the whole thought process of small axe came from. And then I transferred that into also real estate because I feel like just with the small things I have, I don't have much, many resources, but I can sharpen them and I can hone my skills and I can take down something big. Yeah, so I love my, it. Thanks, guys. Fantastic. Thanks, That's Nico. Awesome. Great talking to you guys.